Exodus chapter 5, we're going to start at verse 22, and actually go through the whole chapter 6. So please listen carefully, for this is God's word. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why, do you, why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. And you have not delivered your people at all. Okay, let me stop there just for a minute. So here we have Moses again complaining. And you know, we all do. It's our nature. It's literally our nature to complain. Because we still have the sin nature we're battling with. I'm just being honest. Uh, but there's a difference between a complaining, a complaint like Moses has, and I've just now thought of the complaint that they registered in Numbers, I believe it's 16 when they complained against Moses' leadership, and look what happened to him. So there's always a difference, and it, it, it usually lies in the motive in your relationship with Jesus Christ when you complain. But Moses, his, you see, what's happening to him is his disappointment. He's complaining to the Lord. He's disappointed because he had unrealistic expectations to begin with. He came and he, remember, the Lord had told him, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart in order to multiply my signs and reveal myself to not only Pharaoh, but to the whole land of Egypt and to us as we read scripture today. And Moses, he thought, okay, I'm going to go in front of Pharaoh one time and everything's going to fall into place and, and it's going to be deliverance is going to happen. It's going to be that easy. But it wasn't. And he had expectations of an early success in his ministry, but it didn't work out that way. But notice that his outburst traces back to his original reluctance to accept the divine commission. Remember that? I believe it's in chapter 4 and 5. Moses, God told Moses, I'm going to send you back. Now, this is important. I'm going to send you back to deliver my people. I am going to deliver my people. So Moses, first thing he had to recognize is God's going to be the one working. Not, Moses is not going to be able to do anything in his own flesh. He's going to have to depend on the Lord and be used by the Lord to accomplish anything. That's all of us. Anything in life that we accomplish for the Lord's name is going to be, we're going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do that. So what does that mean? Yes, that's exactly what it means. When you get to heaven, you're going to throw your crowns at his feet. I don't think it's going to be a literal crown, because you're going to recognize it was what a privilege it was to be used by the Lord. It, it, nothing you do in your flesh is ever going to be pleasing to God. The Holy Spirit is has to be the one that empowers you. But this is what's happening here. Moses, but listen, look at Moses, though. Moses, it is. It's this old sin coming back. Well, I can't speak well. Send somebody else. I can't. I can't do this. You know, all the complaints he had with God, and God was patiently saying to him, it's not going to be you doing it. I'm going to be working through you. You're going to be a willing vessel, but it's going to be me working through you. And so here's Moses. He's coming. Now, once he got the message, he was overjoyed, and he was ready to go back. He was empowered by the Lord, and he finally got it, and he's ready to go back in the name's Lord and go in front of Pharaoh. But then what happens? It doesn't work out the way he thinks it should have worked out, and he starts complaining to God again. And, you know, what that says to me is many of us deal with sins. Well, we all do. But there's certain sins in each one of our lives that sometimes the Lord lets it linger in order to humble us, in order for us to completely learn how to be dependent on him. There's other sins he will take away immediately. Now I'll use me for an example, and I've said this before. Before I became a born-again Christian, I, every other word out of my mouth was a swear word. And I smoked. I'm not saying smoking is this horrible sin, but I smoked. Well, when I became born again, he took the cursing direct out of me completely. And I remember, I looked back and I said, it's been a couple weeks since I even said a swear word. You see, it was something, he was like confirming to me, my own opinion, that I was saved. But yet, I could not overcome this habit of smoking. And I'd smoke about 10 cigarettes, half a pack a day, whatever it was. And 
That went on for about three or four years, okay? And I had a pastor say to me one time, I said, what do you think about smoking? You know, I was a baby Christian, whatever. And he said, well, I just think if you smoke, you're going to get to heaven sooner. <laughs> and, you know, and, and he's right, he's right, but, you see, the Holy Spirit was convicting me. He was convicting me because it was a bad witness. It was a bad witness because I was witnessing to people at Boise, and I'd smoke. And I, just, I knew what the Lord was saying to me, it's a bad witness. It has nothing to do with your salvation, it's just a bad witness. So I would bargain with the Lord, I won't get into all that. And I just could not quit. I quit for a week. I quit for two weeks. I go back to smoking. Then after five or six years of struggling with smoking, suddenly, I remember waking up one day and said, wow, I haven't smoked for about two months. He just took that desire out of me. I haven't smoked for 20, 25 years. But he was showing me. He let that sin, because if you want to call it sin, smoking is damaging your body, but at the same time, he was telling me I had to quit, and I couldn't. So it's disobedience any way you look at it. He was showing me that there are, I have to depend on him. I can't do it in my own strength. I have to rely on him to do it. He's showing me the difference between struggling in the flesh and relying on him. And that's what's happening with Moses, and that's what's happening with all of us. Moses has that sink, crop it right back up, disappointed, complaining to God. Just like he did when God told him the first time, I'm going to send you. And sometimes the Lord allows those sins to, to keep us humble and to, to learn spiritual warfare. But look at verses 1 through 12. It says, But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand, he would drive them out of this land. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But my name, Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. So the Lord said to Moses, Go in. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But Moses said to them, Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge about the people of Israel and about Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. You know, once again, we have Moses blames God and complains to the Lord that the Lord has made his job harder on him. It's just like the foreman when they complain and say, why are you beating us? You're the, you're, it's your people, Pharaoh's, it's your people that denied us straw to make bricks. You're, you're beating us. And in the Israelites, we're going to see all through this, they keep complaining to Moses. See, we all complain. That's what we do. And but the reality is, now remember this, every time we complain, we are calling God's character into question. You see, Moses has yet to learn, and it's all of us, that there's more at stake than how he's doing. There's more at stake than how you're doing, Marianne. There's more at stake than how you're doing, Roy. It's about God's character. And when you, and when you are going through hard circumstances before you complain, Say, thank you, Lord, 
for putting me through these hard circumstances because I may not like it, but I know that you're the one with all the wisdom. You, the godly wisdom is beyond what we can even imagine. His godly wisdom, and he's put me in this situation. He's allowed me to go through these hard circumstances for his glory. That's what it comes down to. And he doesn't want us in love with this world. He doesn't. He wants, we're going to, if Christ was sinless in this life, and yet he suffered, how much more are we going to suffer in this life? Because that's just part of being in a sin-cursed world, a sin-cursed environment. And remember, the Lord's character is at stake. Because he says, in Hebrews 13, but he says, he keeps saying, I'm faithful to all my promises. And I'm faithful, I'll, I said I will always be with you, Moses. Just like he said it to Joshua, I will always be with you. He says it to David, he says it to everybody. I am always with you. And if he's always with us, and he's not a tyrant, he's working through those circumstances for our good. I guarantee you right now, George is happy that he went through the trials that he did in this life. Because he understands now, more than any of us in this room, what they were for. And he's thanking the Lord. But here, before I get into verse 2 and 3, where it says... Uh, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. Now, scholars, they've written books, books and books on this subject. What do you mean God didn't make his name known to the Egypt, to, the, to Moses? He just, he's made his name known to them all through the Bible. That's true. I'm going to get back to that at the end of my message. A principle behind that. But you have scholars who talk about the JE and P controversies and all that. But it's, it's really simple, and I'm going to get to it at the end of my message. But look, but realize that in verse 12, in verse 12, and we're going to get to the end of chapter 6, and we're going to say the same thing again. He talks about uncircumcised lips. He says, how then shall Pharaoh listen to me, for I am of uncircumcised lips. And when I was reading that in the Hebrew, I did not recognize the word. I didn't recognize it. <coughs> circumcised, that, that word, that doesn't mean circumcised. And there's about three different words that mean circumcised, circumcision. And when I was going through my Hebrew vocabulary cards, way at the end of them, there it was. There was the word. And so I went and I looked back at the, the Hebrew, and yeah, okay, that's the word. It does literally mean circumcise. And it's only used like 35, 36 times in the Bible. And if you go into the Old Testament, you know, the word only being used that many times, I mean, it's hardly ever used. But what they're trying to say there is all through Scripture, and, you know, we can, you can write these verses down, but Deuteronomy 10, 16, Deuteronomy 36, let me read Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. It says, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. Now God commanded the Israelites, the Abraham, starting with Abraham, circumcise all your male children. And you know we have rights in the Christian church. Baptism is one of them. Uh, different rights that we have, but those rights are not what saves you, and they knew that. It's coming to church doesn't save you, but when you're born again, you want to come to church, and that's just part of your new nature, but you're already saved. That's why you're going to church. You're already saved. That's why you're being baptized. Circumcision, and they knew this, is the same basic thing. All through the Old Testament, you have the Lord saying, the Lord will circumcise your heart. So in that you can love the Lord of God with all your heart and with all your soul. But Romans, one of my favorite verses, 2.29, listen to what Paul says. He says, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. So that is just well known. They would know this. When he's talking about, so Moses is saying, well, I'm of uncircumcised lips. I can't speak. He's complaining again. 
But what he's saying, I think what the Holy Spirit is applying here to us, is Moses is struggling in the flesh. Remember, he's, it's up to me, God. Why are you making my job harder? Why aren't I just delivering these people? He has to learn that it's not through his flesh. It's not through his own strength. Because then who would get the glory? Moses would. It's going to have to be in a completely dependent relationship with the God of Israel, allowing him to do it through you. And so what Moses says, I'm of uncircumcised lips. They're not going to listen to me. You know, my response is, well, no kidding, Moses. If you're relying on your flesh, uncircumcised lips, it's not going to work. You have to allow the Lord to speak through you. That's the principle coming. But here's one more thing before we move on. In verse 7, it says, I will take you. This is beautiful. This is just beautiful. I will take you. Now that word take you in Hebrew is a common word. And it's always used for marriage. I will take you to be my wife. I, it's, that's the word that's used. So let me read verse 7. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from the burdens of the Egyptians. It's a marriage covenant. God with his people. We are Christ's bride. It is a marriage covenant that we are in with God. But one more thing, and that's in verse 9. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. You see, what does Jesus say in John 8? I will set you free from the bondage of sin. It's the same principle being said here. Whenever you see the, the, the Israelites complain, it's always they're complaining because they, they're a hard burden, they're hard work. They won't listen to Moses. And that's a picture of somebody bound in sin. If you're bound in sin, you're not going to listen to the Lord. If you're bound in sin, you will not come to Christ. If you're bound in sin, everything's distorted in your mind. So what is, has to happen? The Holy Spirit comes to everybody, and, he, and he, he, he starts working in your heart. It's the Holy Spirit opening your ears, opening your eyes to the Bible, convicting you of sin. And when the Holy Spirit does that, you come to Christ and give yourself to Jesus Christ. Because you may not have another opportunity, but you know when the Lord is speaking to you. You know. That's how horrible sin is. I just don't wake up one day and decide I'm going to give myself to Christ. You don't. You can't do it in a natural state of thing because you're a sinner. You're, you're in bondage to sin. You're not going to hear the message. But when you are convicted, and I believe it happens to everybody many times in their life, when you're convicted of sin, you, you, you don't understand this because you don't at that point, but I'm telling you, it's the Holy Spirit working in you, convicting you of your sin, moving you to give yourself to Christ, and you better do it, because you may not have another opportunity. And I believe in hell. It's only my opinion. But part of the punishment in hell is those people, that shooter in Texas. Right now, it's going through his mind continuously all the times the Lord spoke to him. All the times he knew the gospel was being preached to him clearly. And he never accepted Christ. And that something's going to go over his mind for eternity. That's just my opinion. But let's look at verses 14 through 30. These are the heads of their fathers' houses. The sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel. Hanak, Palu, Hezron, and Karma. These are the clans of Reuben. The sons of Simeon. Jemal, Jamon, Ohad, Jackin, Zora, oh boy, and Shol, <laughs> the son of a Canaanite woman. These are the clans of Simeon. These are the names of the sons of Levi, according to their generations. Gershom, Kohath, and Merah. The years of the life of Levi being 137 years. The sons of Gershom, Libni, and Shemaiah, by their clans. The sons of Korah. Amron, Isra, Hebron, and Isaiah, and the years of the life of Korah being 133 years. 
the sons of Merai, Mala, and Musha. These are the clans of the Levites according to their generations. Amram took, there is that word for marriage, Amram took as his wife Jochbed, his father's sister, and she bore him Aaron and Moses, the years of the life of Amram being 137 years. The sons of Isra, Korah, Nephid, and Sekera, the sons of Uziel, Mishael, Elisphon, and Sithri. Aaron, there's that word again, Aaron took as his wife Elishabi, the daughter of Ebedah, and her sister, and the sister of Nashon, and she bore him Nadia, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, the sons of Korah, Aser, Elkanai, and Absoph. These are the clans of the Korathites. Eleazar, Aaron's son, there's his word again, took as his wife one of the daughters of Putel, and she bore him Phanias. These are the heads of the father's house of the Levites by their clans. These are, the, these are the Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, Bring out my people of Israel from the land of Egypt by their hosts. It was they who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, about bringing out the people of Israel from Egypt this Moses and this Aaron. One day when the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, the Lord said to Moses, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say to you. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips. How will Pharaoh listen to me? Okay, all those passages, took as wife, took his wife. I'm going to read verse 7 one more time. I would take you to be my people, I will marry you, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from the burdens of the Egyptians. And one of my favorite verses in the Old Testament in Ezekiel is chapter 20, verse 1 and 2, when he, right before he gives the Ten Commandments. He says, I took you out of the bondage of Egypt, and I give you the Ten Commandments. In other words, I took you out of your sin, now you can hear the Ten Commandments. But, real fast here, let me just say this on genealogies. Genealogies are important because I, God is recording everything we do. He is. I, I, I'm convinced of that. But, notice that genealogies ended in Matthew and Luke. When Christ came, there's no more genealogies in the Bible. So the genealogy served a purpose to point, to tell the people that the line to Christ is still intact, that everything points to Christ. And when the, the last genealogies we see in the Bible is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, because the fullness of time had come. And, the, and, and this gets to the point of knowing God at a deeper level. Because, you see, when it says, you did not know my name back in verse 2 and 3, well, they did know the name. But, you see, with all of us, we're going to know, when you go through something, and when you're maturing in the faith, you're growing in your faith to Christ, you are knowing God at a deeper, more intimate level. So, the, the Israelites in Egypt are going to know God at a more intimate level than Abraham. Because they're about to witness God, it's is the appointed time for God to form a nation and bring them out of Egypt. And they're going to witness the miracles, they're going to witness the power of God. And they're going to know God at a deeper level because of this. That's what they're saying in, in verses 2 and 3. And it's all of us. When you go through a hard circumstance, you're going to know because you go through that hard circumstance, because you deal with death of loved ones, because you deal with health issues, and you rely on the Lord and let him work through this situation, you're going to know God at a deeper, more intimate level. And beloved, Dwayne, Troy, Arlen, and George, know God at a deeper level than any of us in this room right now. And that's what we have to look forward to. And you notice too, because remember what Paul says about genealogies. He says, quit Busying yourself, but however he says that, he says it a couple times, I think in Timothy and some other place. Quit uh, 
busy in your mind with useless genealogies. They profit now. We have people today that are bound on, they still think genealogies serve a purpose in the spiritual realm, and they don't. There's nothing wrong with having a genealogy to know your family roots. But with the spiritual, just remember this, the, the genealogies have stopped when Christ came. And, no, and so we have Moses here. There's no, and when we go through genealogies and whatnot, there's no exhortation that says, be like Moses. We may hear a commercial of this, be like Mike, Jordan. But nowhere in scripture does it say, be like Moses, be like David, be like this, this, and this. Paul says it was another issue there. And why is that? Because Moses, look at what Moses is, he's complaining, just like all of us are complaining. But you know how much God loved Moses? You know how much he loves each one of us? He wants us to be brutally honest. He wants us, the only way we're going to grow in the Lord. And I'm just telling you that don't ever measure God's love for you by all your bitterness at times you get into. It's probably the opposite that's actually happening. But you see, like many Old Testament people, Moses and everybody else in the Bible is a complex character who have messy lives, but God uses them. And, and, and I said this yesterday at Pelican Point. I said, I know myself, I wouldn't want to be in the Bible. Because what's the Lord doing when he puts somebody in the Bible? He's given everybody for eternity to see all their wars just so that we can grow in that. So don't be too harsh on David or Moses or any of these people because if Peter, any of them, Paul, because Paul, what was he doing before the Lord called him to ministry? Because we, we all in this room have messy lives. We have issues. And I, when I get down to Pelican Point, we're going through the prayer request, it's a mess. It's an absolute mess. Because we all are messy. It, our lives are messy. Every one of our lives. We have warts that you won't believe. All of us do. But beloved, that's what the Lord loves. He lo and it's not going to get any, it's not going to get perfect until we get to heaven. And Christ has purchased that perfection. He has. You have a down payment. Patrick has a down payment that he's going to be perfect. Because, you see, Patrick, Irma, when she accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior, she's saying, I cannot ever live a per, uh, sinless life. I can't. I forfeited any claim on heaven. God the Father said, you had to be perfect like I am. But Jesus Christ, he lived the sinless life. So when we say we believe in Jesus Christ, now just think about what I'm saying here. We're, we're saying, I believe what Christ did. That his sinless life is given to me. His righteousness covers me. That's the only reason I go to heaven. The only reason. And if he has purchased a perfect sinless life for me, why aren't I perfect now? I will be. George is. He's perfect. Think about that. But, um, 